Epilogue. Kathleen Owen's mother was never imprisoned again, although she continued to work fearlessly for suffrage. Within the next few months, the Bowen family was struck by a deep tragedy. The influenza epidemic of 1918 had just begun to break out, and Cassie Bowen, who was at Radcliffe, became sick one night and by the next morning was in a coma. She died a few days later. The epidemic, the worst one in history, killed more than 20 million people throughout the world. Miss Pruitt's Academy shut its doors for most of the winter and spring term of 1918. Miss Pruitt's elderly sister, Miss Janet, died of the illness. Posey Elder, however, was the only student for Miss Pruitt's who succumbed to the influenza. Far away in Europe, the flu raged as well, but Nell continued to drive her ambulance through the mud behind the lines of war-torn France. She returned at the end of the war in 1918, after the armistice, and entered medical stool. Alma never returned. She indeed had fallen in love with Cyril Eddington. When she was 18, they married, and she became the Duchess of Eddington. Cat and her family, and Alma's family, including her father, who had since reconciled with Auntie Claire, sailed over together for the wedding at the Eddington family estate, Stoke March. Cat and Clary were bridesmaids. Alma continued to work with the Red Cross and the Voluntary Aid Detachment in England. After the wedding, Cat returned to the United States to begin her studies at Radcliffe College. She majored in classics and became fascinated with archaeology. In 1922, in the Valley of the Kings of Egypt, the tomb of King Tutankhamun had been discovered by Egyptologist Howard Carter. Excavations for this tomb were to go on for several years. Pat tried to get on the excavation team, but was refused, because women were not permitted as official team members. She decided to try her luck going as a journalist to cover the exciting discovery for the Boston Globe. So impressed was Howard Carter with her thorough presentation that he invited her to examine a few small artifacts and write them up as a monograph for, scho for a scholarly journal. Once more, Cat Bowen impressed him with her scholarship, insight, and good writing. Finally, Carter appealed to Lady Car Carnivon, the benefactor and supporter of the project, and requested that a small stipend be given so Miss Kathleen Bowen could work through the following field season. Cat became one of the most important team members in the excavation of the burial chamber. She dropped out of Radcliffe for a year and a half to work on King Tut's tomb, but then returned to graduate with honors in 1926. She went on to get a graduate degree in archaeology, and on another dig in Egypt, met her future husband when she was bitten by a cobra and nearly died. Her husband, Dr. Solomon Gershon, was in a group of tourists and immediately knew what to do to prevent shock and heart seizure. She was rushed to the nearest medical station and administered a potent antivenom drug. Cat lingered in a coma for almost a week, and Solomon, intrigued by this unique and daring young American woman, fell in love with her. It took Cat a little longer. Gershon told her it was love at first sight, but as Cat reminded him, she was in a coma with her eyes closed, so she needed a little more time. They married two years later. The Bowen Gershons, as they became known, settled in New York, where Solomon practiced medicine and Cat took a position at Barnard College as a professor of classics and archaeology. They had three children, all girls, one named Cassandra. It was Cassandra to whom Cat gave the diary. Cassandra in turn typed it with carbon sheets and gave it to each of her four daughters and to her one son. Cat had become president of the League of Women Voters in New York City and continued her mother's fight for women's rights until her death this past year. On her gravestone, she requested only her name and the phrase, Ain't I a woman? Life in America in 1917 Historical Note Although Cat's mother, Eleanor Bowen, is a fictional character, she fell on the steps of some very real people who began fighting for women's rights in the middle of the 19th century. Women such as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who are credited with the founding of the women's movement. These women fought not only for the ballot, but also against other terrible inequalities that perhaps are unimaginable to young readers today. For example, it was unlawful for a woman to sue for damages. In 1873, a woman in Massachusetts slipped on the ice and injured herself. She could not sue, but her husband was awarded $1,300 as compensation 
for his loss of her ability to work. It was easy, perhaps, to speak of men being gallant and chivalrous, but fine manners gave women no protection in the eyes of the law. They could not vote. They could not get mortgages. They could not sue in a court of law. They had limited rights of property, and they were often prevented from pursuing higher education. In 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, a housewife and mother of several children, became very angry about the status of women in America. She decided she has to, had to do something to effect a change. One day, Miss Stanton began reading the Declaration of Independence aloud to herself, and an idea was born. Wherever she could, she inserted the word women into this document. For example, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. Mrs. Stanton decided to have a meeting, a convention for women, at which women's rights could be discussed. The meeting was held in her hometown of Seneca Falls, New York, in 1848. Elizabeth and her good friend Lucretia Mott, a Quaker and abolitionist, planned this conference. Elizabeth had met Lucretia because her own husband, Henry Stanton, was a leader in the abolitionist movement. More than 300 women and some 40 men attended that first meeting in July 1848. Among the men was the former slave and great abolitionist Frederick Douglass. It quickly became apparent that the rights of women and the anti-slavery movement had a lot in common. A declaration of principles was signed at the meeting, and a resolution was passed, affirming the rights of women to vote. The conference at Seneca Falls is generally thought of as the beginning of the women's movement in America. The movement began to grow rapidly. During the 1850s, some sort of women's rights convention was held almost every year. At a women's convention in Akron, in Akron Ohio, a former slave, Sojourner Truth stood up to respond to some men who had been ridiculing women. She was furious, and although she had never learned to read or write, she gave one of the most stirring speeches in the history of the women's movement when she asked the question, Ain't I a woman? Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me. Ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man, when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne thirteen children and seen most all sold to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Other leaders began to emerge. Lucy Stone, a magnificent orator, became head of the American Women's Suffrage Association, AWSA. Perhaps the greatest of all was Susan B. Anthony. She and Elizabeth Cady Stanton became the two leaders of the National Women's Suffrage Association, NWSA. Anthony organized women to go door to door in the state of New York to gather signatures to submit to the state legislator for three reforms. The right of women to control their own earnings, the right to be the legal guardians of their own children, and the right to vote. There were 6,000 signatures on the petition, but the state judiciary committee told her that that was not enough. So she began again on Christmas Day of 1854 to get more. She went to countless towns, gave innumerable speeches, and distributed literature and petitions concerning women's rights. At one point, her feet became frostbitten in the bitter cold, and she had to be carried onto the stage for her speech. Eventually, she collected 400,000 signatures and had raised more than $3,000 for the Union effort in the Civil War. In 1872, Susan B. Anthony voted in Rochester, New York, and was arrested and prosecuted for voting illegally. Voting would not become legal until November 1917, when New York became a suffrage state, giving women the right to vote. The western states, however, moved more quickly. In 1869, the Wyoming Territory adopted a women's suffrage, and in 1890 became the first state admitted to the Union as a suffrage state. During the 1890s, Colorado, Idaho, and Utah entered the Union as suffrage states. The efforts of the women in the East were, however, undaunted. The two associations, one led by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the other by Lucy Stone, eventually merged into a new group called the National American Women's Suffrage Association, NAWSA. A new leader was emerging. Much younger than Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Stanton, Carrie Chapman Catt was incisive and politically minded. She set out a plan at the annual convention of the NAWSA that coordinated the natural, national, state, and local branches of the association in their efforts. She also organized a finance committee, 
Mrs. Catt became the head of the organization committee and of the NAWSA, and in 1900, upon Susan B. Anthony's retirement, became president of the association. She made sure that every single state and territory in the Union was brought into the National American. In 1910, Washington was won as a woman's suffrage state, and by the following year, California had passed suffrage. In 1912, Alice Paul, who had earned a Ph.D. in social work, had just returned from England, where she had been studying firsthand the conditions in British tenements and the work of settlement houses, or charity homes, for orphans and poor people. She became involved in suffrage in England, and then returned to the United States to Washington, D.C., to work on a federal amendment for women's suffrage. Just as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton became a team, so did Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, who had also just arrived in Washington. Together they founded the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage and later the National Women's Party. They led many demonstrations in Washington, which had already had several women's suffrage clubs, and with the help of the billionaire Mrs. O. H. P. Belmont, were able to establish the headquarters of their party in the Cameron House, a mansion across Lafayette Square from the White House. Alice Paul was a great publicist. She organized not only demonstrations in Washington, but also in 1915 arranged a motor caravan from San Francisco to Washington that carried a suffrage petition that was 18,000 feet long and bearing half a million names. However, it was in 1917 that she gained the most press attention when she organized the silent vigil of the Women's Party pickets at the White House. During this time, more than 200 women were arrested in violation of their civil rights, as defined by the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, which guarantees freedom of speech, and the Clayton Act, which made it lawful for any American to demonstrate. The women were incarcerated and treated brutally. The truth about this treatment was revealed by a former matron, Mrs. Bur Virginia Bovey, who had worked at Aquaquan. A hunger strike began in November of that year, and by December 3rd, all remaining prisoners were released. Other smaller incidents, such as when Cassie asked for the Attorney General's re resignation, were based on fact. Mr. Gregory, the Attorney General at that time, really did suggest that hoses be turned on the women to make them look ridiculous. The August riots in which the women were attacked by young Army and Navy men, and during which three men scaled the wall of the headquarters building and nearly pulled Lucy Burns off the balcony, really did happen. A shot was fired at that time into the headquarters, narrowly missing Ella Dean. By the end of 1917, six states had won the right for women to vote. In fact, by the end of that year, the number of presidential electoral votes in which women had a share was 215. The pressure was on. Within days after the release of the women from Aquaquan and the Washington, D.C. City Jail, committees in Congress began acting on the suffrage amendment. They went to President Wilson, who finally agreed to a date for a vote on the amendment. The House of Representatives agreed to vote on the suffrage amendment on January 10, 1918. The 19th Amendment passed in the House of Representatives, but did not pass in the U.S. Senate until 1919. Finally, in 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified by two-thirds of the state, and the American women gained the vote. In anticipation of the passage of the amendment, Carrie Catt, in 1919, formed a new organization called the League of Women Voters to make sure that women really did get out and vote once they had the right. The League also taught citizenship classes in schools, and on election days they would babysit and provide rides to the polls for women. The story, however, of women's rights wasn't as far from over. In the 1960s and 1970s, the women's movement found vigorous new leaders who fought for issues such as equal pay and equal opportunities in the workplace. The National Organization for Women was founded by Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, a journalist, and Kate Millett, a scholar, were among many women who wrote extensively on the subject of feminism. Although many good bills and laws were passed, such as the Equal Pay Act of 1964, the Equal Rights Amendment failed to win ratification to the disappointment of many American women. Women today continue to struggle to gain and protect those rights that Elizabeth Cady Stanton whispered to herself as she reread the Declaration of Independence in her home in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848.